trying to change the world here, people. Oh, really? The Facebooking and the tweeting and the Instagramming, all that would not exist without our understanding of science. So it's amazing that you do that as an insult. If you mean true for you, it's different from true for anybody else. Have yeah, to absolutely, to you. because I can't think either got to be true or not. I can't, no, no. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and citizens of Netlandia. Welcome to O'Reilly Radio Show 111. That's 111A for Friday, May 27th, 2016, where we dismantle the current events for your edutainment through mostly rational conversations that'll make you say, Oh, really? I'm your host, Andy Cowan, and I have uh, some pre-recorded segments by Fred Sims and some uh, news in the uh, in the sciences produced by Michael Robinson. But unfortunately, I am flying solo today. Everyone else had other things to do. So, that's okay. We'll just let them do their thing. I shall punish them later. The floggings will continue until morale improves. No, anyway. All right, so, audience audience feedback. I, I didn't have any show notes. Nobody sent me any, any colorful messages and no, no voicemails. Nothing, nothing of that nature. So, um, I'm bound to make copious mistakes because I'm, I'm by myself. So, no one is here to watch me so no one's here to correct me except for maybe you out there in the chat room that way you can actually uh you know give me some feedback and tell me uh no you got that so wrong so wrong nope nope no all wrong uh and that's fine because i welcome to uh to have anything that i say corrected so if you find one and you're watching in post uh, or you're listening in the rss through podcast then go ahead and pause and send us a note Oh, really radio podcast at gmail.com or if that's too much trouble you can go ahead and just leave us a voicemail 470-222-6759 you can also send text to there i'll get i'll get all of that and i will add it to the show notes for next week i also have done many many things with our patreon page uh so now there are some better reward levels and i'm also now Cutting the show into two because it was just a bit of a bear as we get older. You know, our bladders have to do things. So uh, having that little potty break in the middle certainly was a plus. Uh, however, when editing, I can kind of get things out a little earlier. And uh, I just found that for SEO and things of that nature for the show, it was better off to release the second half of the show later in the week. But for patrons, I will give it to you as soon as it's ready. It will be listed right there on, on Patreon and available for donors of any level so just give me a little money how about that and i have two two patreon supporters i've got lissa p and don d thank you so much for contributing to this little hobby project of of mine and my friends uh it 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 really means more than i could ever possibly say like tears and things like that that's that's what it really means because it, it means that something i'm doing is worth it to people to actually give a little bit of their hard-earned cash over to me and that's that's amazing that's an amazing feeling if you have ever created something and had somebody actually want to buy it from you um yeah it, it, it's right right here in the heart oh it's good it's good so i i thank you very much from the bottom of my heart especially uh don you have uh, you have been a loyal patron since there was a patreon account uh, so you, you are another superstar in my book and we've been friends for, for a very long time and you're one of the best people that I know. Okay. Enough ingratiating myself to other people. Now I have, uh, I've got hard copy here and it is a speech. So in my little potpourri guest rants thing, I'm going to read it. I'm going to try and do a dramatic reading, <clears throat> perhaps a little water because this is going to be a good one, I think. Uh, yes, okay, that's very good. All right. Now, <clears throat> uh, let's see. <clears throat> we grow in number each time I visit. Thank you, my friends, for your courage and dedication to our cause. I have just come from Europe, my homeland. In fact, uh, in fact, and do you know that what I saw there? It was an invading army. These so-called refugees, millions of them marching across the continent, bringing their fanatical beliefs and their crime with them. They attack our women and bomb our cities. And how do our leaders respond? 
Do they push back and enforce the borders, as is our sovereign duty? Of course not. They say, here, take our food. Here, our shelter. Take our way of life. And then take our lives. Despicable. So, is it good to be here? So, <clears throat> so it is good to be here where some men still know how to fight. When I was young, a young man, there was a great war. And our two countries did not see eye to eye. But all the sides, they all agreed on certain things. The fundamental responsibility of a nation. Protecting the land through strength. Persevering the heritage and culture of the people. Offering them opportunity. Now look at the world today. Look here at the dead husk that was these United States. How the mighty have fallen. Who was protected, I ask you? On my flight, I was briefed about these brave patriots fighting the government's illegal claims to their land. Who does the land belong to if not the people? This is who your government sees as the transgressors. What about the criminal trespassers who make a mockery of your borders? No, they are protected, of course. But that is only the beginning. Your entire culture is under siege. The principles your country was founded upon lost in the name of tolerance. Your religion, your beliefs, your sense of community all tossed aside like trash. And you cannot even speak out against it, lest you be called a bigot. And who benefits from all this but the vultures feasting on this carcass? The bankers who stole your homes out from under you, and the politicians they purchased. Well, let them call you what they will. I know who you truly are. The beginning of a revolution. The first to see the collapse of the old guard and the road to something glorious. Who do you think said that? Who do you think that that speech was? It sounded an awful lot like um, like a particular political leader, um, if you dare call him that. Um, <laughs> could be anybody, actually, on perhaps the Republican side. Um, though it does have tinges of the revolutionary spirit through, say, Bernie Sanders. But it's a little more vitriolic. A little more, shall I say... Hail Hydra. That is... <laughs> yeah, that's that's exactly who you think it is, the Red Skull. Um, this is from the most recent issue of Captain America. And he's, he's there, and at the end it says, The Glory of Hydra. The beginning of a revolution, the first to see the collapse of the old guard and the road to something glorious. The Glory of Hydra. So we have life imitating art, art imitating life, and all those, all those fun things. And with that, I will, um, I'll break into. I will let Fred take it from here. But uh, mind you, there's a little bit of a spoiler in here because he's the one that brought me this. And with that, um, if you don't want to know, then I recommend fast forwarding uh, about seven minutes or so. I think something like that uh, and then you won't get any spoilers on the most recent comic even though i think it's uh it's kind of like how the the latest game of thrones has been how everything has been out there on the internet and and you cannot avoid it but uh with that here's fred in a little pre-recorded thing frozen like a bug in amber no wait here we go hit play Good evening, oh really radio listeners. This is Fred with This Week in History. Um going to do history a little bit different. Um, I mean, we've been doing it differently recently. I've been playing around with it, seeing what works. Um, recent events tie into history um, quite often. Uh, lately, I've been plugging a lot of comic book stuff, trying to, you know, keep the interest up, get people involved. 
um, do that kind of thing. Just, you know, refine comic books as a, as a medium. I know they're huge right now. You know, you see all the Marvel movies and things like that, but it, it's still a good thing to, to give to children. And, and I like to tie as much of the show right now into what I have as a passion. Um, and, and so today we're going to do that with history. Um, if you are a nerd and you have the internet, there's been a lot of talk recently uh, regarding a revelation in a mo most recent Captain America comic book. Um, so I was going to go a little bit into that, and, and this ends up being a bit of history, a bit of a rant, um, mainly because I'm not sure what my feelings are here. Um, a little bit of history regarding Captain America. Um, Cap Steve Rogers was created in 1940 by Jack Kirby and Joe Simon. Uh, he was designed as a patriotic super soldier who often fought the Axis powers uh, of World War II. Um, his first issue sold nearly one million issues after it depicted Captain America punching Hitler, um, basically even a, over a year before America was even involved in World War II. Um, creator Joe Simon has said in the past that Captain America was a consciously political creation. Um, he and Kirby were morally repulsed by the actions of Nazi Germany in the years leading up to the U.S. involvement in World War II, as they would be as um, Jewish American um, citizens, and they felt war was inevitable. You know, he's quoted as saying, the opponents to the war were all quite organized, and we wanted to have our say too. The first issue actually went on sale in December 1940. Uh, it was cover dated for March 1941, but the sale date of December 1940 was a year before the attack on Pearl Harbor, and as I mentioned uh, before, a year before um, U.S. involvement, and uh, actually a full year already into World War II. Um, most readers responded favorably to the comic, um, but some took objection. Uh, Simon is noted as saying when the first issue came out, we got quite a bit of threatening letters and hate mail. Some people really opposed to what Cap stood for. Um, I think that is, you know, it, it ties into what you're seeing now. And again, that comes to if you have the internet and you're any bit of nerd, you are seeing um, that the latest issue of Steve Rogers, Captain America, the first issue, um, that Steve Rogers is a Hydra agent and apparently has been since he was a child um you know ha has been has had ties to hydra since childhood and has been a hydra agent this whole time and you are seeing uh quite a lot of people opposed to what cap stands for even though we don't know what he stands for right now um it, it's one of those situations where it's one comic book in we have no idea where this is going but the writer nick spencer has said that this is not a body double, it's not a clone, it's not mind control. This is Steve Rogers, it is Captain America, he is in Hydra. And from here we're going to see what the new status quo is. Um, this is one of those things where I don't really know how I personally feel about the situation. I want to see how it plays out, I want to see what they do with Steve Rogers as Hydra. Um, I don't necessarily think it means he has to go evil. But um, there is a line, and it, it's one of those situations where the Nazis didn't think they were the bad guys. They, they thought that they were doing what they were doing to make the world a better place. And if that's what Captain America has been doing this whole time, um, trying to make the world a better place while being a member of HYDRA and doing it for a select group of people, that makes him bad whether he wants to be or not. Um, and, and what it does to, you know people who grew up with this shining symbol of do right and morality and goodness and what everyone has always envisioned America to represent really playing for the other side the entire time um you know it it, it makes you question things like this plays a lot it, it plays a little too closely to how things are going right now in our country um it, it's one of those situations where the line between fantasy and reality is so close that you can't tell the difference. I mean, this is Captain America. He is a fictional character, but how does this work? You know, it, it, it's blurred. It's a, it's a line that you can't separate. Like, 
what is happening in our current political climate to what is happening in this comic, it, it's right there. They're the same. And yes, it's, you know, you take inspiration from what you see, but it's, it's all too easy. Real life shouldn't be blended with fiction so easily. Um, that's the point of fiction. It's to entertain you. It's, it's the what if. It's supposed to be these wild ideas. And this is not, you know, this is what we are seeing every day. So it's just one of those things where, you know, we talk about history for a reason, especially on this show. I mean, we've shown in, in multiple clips and we've shown in, in um, you know, multiple instances how history always comes back around and it, it always it's always there you can always learn from it you can always experience it you know when i started this segment is now history um you know history is an ever-changing ever-evolving animal and it's always going to reshape itself um and look oddly familiar to what you've already experienced it, it's the the magic um magic nature of what history does um this is an interesting turn and it'll be something you know to keep track of if you're a fan of the comic books and um i'm i'm very interested to see you know what it means uh in in the comic book universe and what other events they take from our current climate and use in this twisted version of the superhero um, I'm interested to see what it means for fans, you know, do, do they lose, you know, a good portion of their fan base? Do people turn on the character? Do people stay beloved to the character? Um, you know, what does it mean to, you know, maybe people who were inspired to join our armed forces based off of a comic book character? You know, it may seem laughable, but it's out there. You know, this is an inspiration to people young and old for years he was created in 1940 you know he, he was a political activist voice on get us into the war um he has he stands for so many things and i'm very curious to see what history ends up changed as a result of this comic book um if you can find it get out there and pick it up give it a read see where it goes and, um, you know, stay tuned. Have a good rest of the show and enjoy yourselves. Ah, thank you, Fred. Thank you, Fred. So he, he had he struck on so many chords that were really um, I wish he was here. And I wish uh, some of the other guys were here to to tangent off that, because it, it is true that many people are very deeply affected by what comic book characters do. You know, it, it affects their lives greatly. There was a, uh, a member of the army who had his name changed to Optimus Prime. And <laughs> it, was, it was hilarious because one of the generals um, had sent him a letter that said it, it was a, a great honor to have the leader of the Autobots among his ranks. Um, so humor is not dead, um, but also they they take it in in a tongue in cheek serious way. The meaning of these things, um, and it's it's all symbology, and it, and it means means a great deal to people. It's um, I wouldn't call it a religion, but it's close in many ways. Some people do have that uh, deep personal relationship with their Captain America, or with their Spider Man, or whichever comic book flavor. Um, you know, suits your fancy. Uh, sometimes we identify more with those fictional characters than we do with the people that are in our regular, you know, meat body, uh, meat space lives. I'm not saying that's bad. Sometimes they're just, they're drawn better. You know, they, ma they make us want to achieve better. Honestly, they have better writers. And with what they did with this, with this, uh, <laughs> this Red Skull speech, that really touched me in, in that way that it probably shouldn't have. It, it reached right down and, and rattled me a bit. Uh, like, oh, oh, this sounds awfully familiar. This is, this is wrong. But that's really great writing. And that was one page um, from that comic. So I, I concur with his reading of that. Uh, if you get a chance, 
get out to the comic book stores. Get back into comics because there's a lot of great art and a lot of uh, a lot of really good writing happening there. And um, just last night, while I was uh, working on on another project, I was I had in the corner of my my vision often dragging into the the center of my vision i i watched uh, captain america winter soldier and um uh avengers age of ultron trying to catch up uh in movies that i have not seen yes i know i hadn't seen them yet uh but i was trying to get caught up so that i can see the the latest stuff and not be uh, not be too far behind so it all of this is happening like right on the heels of that it's like wait captain hydra really i don't know about that I mean, that's definitely not the way that the Steve Rogers in the movies is played. Uh, though that's also not the way that he's been played in any of the any of the comic books. So we'll leave it to the to the real comic book nerds, uh, bless their hearts, to um, to knock this out of the park and figure out what's going on. There's a lot of a lot of things like out on uh, IO9. Everyone, please stop freaking out about that ridiculous Captain America reveal. I don't know. I'm not reading that article. I'm just not going there. I didn't know about any of this. So we'll find out uh, find out how it goes. But hey, thank you very much, Fred, for for getting that uh, that recorded and uh, and looking into an, an interesting angle on history, because it's true. Uh, no one, no one ever thinks they're the villain. You know, just keep that in mind. That guy that's doing the wrong thing. He thinks he's doing it for the right reasons. And evil and good are largely a matter of perspective in this world. So sometimes it's better to have a little more perspective yourself. And on that note, let's hear promo. Are you annoyed by misinformation spreading like crazy? and you want to stop the flood of nonsense coming from all directions? Go to Wikipedia, as do all those millions out there. Did you know there's an edit button on all Wikipedia articles? Why don't you go and hit that button to start making the world's largest online encyclopedia a more reliable source of information? If you're specifically interested in skeptical topics, Come and join us at Guerrilla Skepticism on Wikipedia, an international endeavor to change the world for the better, word by word. There are many ways you can contribute. We just need to start. We speak several languages, all the more reason to join us. We provide training and all the help you need. If you want to make a change, there's a nice community waiting for you out there. Contact us at gsowteam at gmail.com Visit our website, that's GorillaSkeptics.com, or check out the Gorilla Skepticism on Wikipedia Facebook page. If you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. If you're scientifically literate, the world looks very different to you. It's not just a lot of mysterious things happening. There's a lot we understand out there, and that understanding empowers you. If you base medicine on science, you cure people. If you base the design of planes on science, they fly. If you base the design of rockets on science, they reach the moon. It works, bitches. Science, bitches! Welcome to the uh, to the segment that is usually hosted by my associate, my colleague, my friend, Michael Robinson. He is unavailable to be with us today due to a, an illness. But... He went through and he made show notes for me. So let me see if I can do them justice because I didn't know they were for me right off the bat. So let's see here. Okay, and stuck the landing. SpaceX recent test flight, that is. It's not exactly a test flight. Uh, this one was a, um, uh, a supply mission. Uh, no, not a supply mission. It was, let's see. Those Sp grid fins oh. are uh, angled outwards. The guys are I suppose we could watch this then. The entry burn is started. This entry burn will last for about 20 seconds. We're going to be guiding it through the entire way. Okay, back to I'm going to let that play. Uh, so uh, it should shut off. 
Du, 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 du. Ah, yes. It was a successful launch of the Thicom 8 communication satellite. Until last month, this dramatic maritime maneuver had never been done. SpaceX has now pulled it off three straight flights in a row over the last seven weeks. That's pretty darn good. Now this is normal to see the uh, the cloudiness and the lens are going back to the atmosphere. Uh, those cameras themselves will be uh, obfuscated and then cleared as we come through the atmosphere. So we'll be showing you as many views as we can. But the good news right now here in Hawthorne and certainly in space right now is both first stage and second stage are continuing to proceed nominally on track. So let's check back in with the trio while I keep my eye on the data up here. So as you just heard from JPEG, the re-entry burn of the first stage is completely... It's getting there. That's it's getting the there. Here, actually, let me, uh, let me see if I can full-size this. Atmosphere, ...so it doesn't damage its engines with the intense heat of re-entry. Uh, exactly. And once the re-entry burn is complete, we then deploy the... Stage one is checked ...and use the attitude control thrusters, the little white spots that you saw on the side of the vehicle, to effectively fly back to our final destination of the drone ship. And as we begin to descend upon the surface of the drone ship, what will happen is those landing legs that are folded up onto the side of the rocket will deploy, and that protects the nine Merlin engines that are on the bottom of the, of the Falcon 9 as the Falcon 9 lands onto the drone ship. Now we do have the the drone ship. You can see it on your screen right there. Uh, it is possible we might cut out for a second. Uh, the vibration of the engines can sometimes uh, shake the satellite link a little bit, uh, but we hope to give you full video through. You'll be able to see the landing burn of the first stage. Unfortunately, we do not end up seeing the landing burn. Exactly. So here it comes. Shaking. And that's what you're about to see into frame here. And there it is. It's coming in. And they stuck that land in. Now one thing that I found um, super amusing. Okay. Yes. Lots and lots of celebrating. Fantastic, fantastic job, SpaceX. Uh, the drone ship is named Of Course I Still Love You. I found that terribly amusing. Um, but again, beautiful work. Uh, according to an insider source, uh, in mid-July they should be doing another landing on LZ-1 Beachside Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Be ready for the sonic boom. See, I am awfully close to this stuff, so I, I heard him go up and, and all that, that stuff. Um, so amazing stuff, and I believe that what that's alluding to is that they're going to actually land it at the Air Force Station, like on a runway, uh, which they've done in California already. So that would be, this is the fourth successful uh, landing that they've had of, of this style of rocket. Uh, so this is going to be some, some amazing stuff, and that would be number five, I guess, unless there's going to be another one in between there. I do not know the... Uh, the um, I don't know their schedule. Um, but yeah, I definitely uh, you can go take a look at this out on our show notes and read all about it out on space.com or of course uh, there's spacex.com uh, that's actually where I was watching it they have a live feed uh, during during these events as well so speaking of test flights has been a maximum of space programs that every flight is a test flight and that's pretty much true uh, it's simply too expensive to launch enough missions to collect big juicy data sets Jeff Bezos over at Blue Origins Jeff Bezos is also the uh, um, the CEO and founder of a little company, you might have heard of it, Amazon. Um, but he's also over at Blue Origins, and he wants to change that with his relatively inexpensive and autonomous New Shepard design. The more data we get, the safer space travel gets. Let's see what he was actually talking about with this. So this is out on Ars Technica, Scientific Method, Science, and Exploration. Jeff Bezos is trying to destroy his own spacecraft, and that's a good thing company appears to be closing the loop on low-cost, rapidly reusable rocketry. Um, now, Blue Origins and the and the Shepard craft, as I know it, are essentially a, a lower Earth orbit. Um, in fact, just the edge of space. They're not really making it into a, into a functional apogee. Uh, whereas the Falcon 9 and then its, its uh, larger sister, the Falcon 9 Heavy, they're going to be able to get 
things up into stable geosynchronous orbits and, and things like that, because they're simply enormous, enormous beasts of, of machines. Um, the Falcon 9 Heavy is three Falcon 9s put together, basically. Two of the Falcon 9s are acting as boosters, and then they've got, you know, a multi-stage center, um, which is really quite amazing in itself. So it'll have two landings. wonder how they're going to do that. Two barges? Sure, why not? Anyway, so spaceflight entrepreneur Jeff Bezos has promised to test his new Shepard spacecraft to the limit, and perhaps it is time to take him at his word. On Thursday, the founder of Blue Origin said the company has nearly finished planning the next test flight of his space capsule, and this time the crew vehicle will attempt to land with one of its three parachutes intentionally failing. The goal, Bezos said, is to demonstrate new Shepard's ability to safely handle such scenarios. That's a brilliant idea. Quote, it promises to be an exciting demonstration, he wrote, perhaps understatedly, in an email. <laughs> yeah, I think that will be uh, rather interesting. One of the maximum space flights, every launch is a test flight. That's what he, what he said there. Uh, rockets in space flight don't just um, fly frequently enough like airplanes. So it's good. Um, let's see, what else, anything interesting in here? Uh, initially, the company is building six new Shepard capsules, Bezos has said. The first one was lost during initial test flights in 2015. The second capsule and its propulsion mo module have now flown three times. The first two flights of the second capsule and its propulsion module were demonstrated were to demonstrate reusability. With the last flight in April, the company pub pushed the envelope by restarting the rocket's BE-3 engine just 3,600 feet above the ground to test its ability to start and ramp up quickly. It passed, so now comes the parachute test. Oh, that's going to be fun. Okay, so this is um, on screen now is an overhead view of the New Shepard capsule. One of these three parachutes will intentionally fail during the next test. So it has three that, uh, I guess they're explosive bolts. So I'm not sure they're still using that, that style thing. Um, interesting little capsule design. I mean, it's it's small. It's kind of like the Mercury. Um, no, I havenven't seen, actually, any side-by-side -side comparisons. I'll have to do that uh, later on. But Blue Origin, pretty darn cool stuff. So we've got a lot going on in space and in the, in the private sector for space. So this is all very exciting. So speaking of making space flight cheaper, India has unveiled a small reusable craft that only costs $14 million to make its... To make... Uh, Wait, 14 million to make its flight? Oh, okay. So for reference, each NASA shuttle cost 450 million per mission. That's not rebuilding. That's not you know built from scratch. That's just all the things that it had to do between missions. Now this craft is unmanned and mostly a, a test platform, but it's a proof of concept showing how affordable space programs can be. So India is one of those burgeoning markets. Really? That's it? It looks like a little space shuttle. It's got a delta wing and definitely a lot of uh, heat-resistant material. It's not exactly the most aerodynamic-looking thing. Huh, that's interesting. So on my screen, I've got, um, got an image of what appears to be their craft. It is very small. I mean, it's not really any larger than, I'd say... Maybe a Piper Cherokee, a, a, a dual dual engine um, propeller plane, small, maybe a six seater. This is um, it's similar in size, but the wingspan is much truncated uh, in that delta formation. So uh, let's see, what does it say here? The unmanned reusable launch vehicle RLV-TD is 7 meters, 23 feet long, and weighs 1.7 tons. It was launched at 7 a.m. local time um, on Monday morning on top of India's own HS-9 solid rocket booster from Satish Dwan Space Center in uh, Sharakota. Yeah, I'll go with that because nobody's here to correct me. The booster uh, took it to a height of 56 kilometers, about 35 miles, and using its autonomous propulsion, the RLVTD reached a peak height of uh, 40 miles. As planned, it, uh, it then began its descent, gliding towards the Bay of Bengal. 
uh, how the vehicle would cope with atmosphere re-entry, flying at, in at about 6,000 kilometers per hour or 3,800 uh, miles per hour, uh, was the main focus of the mission. So the RLTD was successfully steered by the automatic navigation system, and it survived re-entry. It flew about 10 minutes before landing at sea. Um, interesting thing. So it's kind of like, like a shuttle on top of a rocket. That's an interesting picture. Not something that... Not something I'd thought of. So basically, the, the top... The entire um, crew module, or spacecraft as it would be, that is on top of the booster rocket, you know, what, what we would see as a capsule, you know, traditionally. This capsule has wings and control surfaces. So it will then separate and then becomes its own little thing, as opposed to having it strapped onto the rocket on the side or on the, on the belly, like we used to do here in the United States, and of course the way they did in, the, in Soviet Russia. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting design. It's certainly simple. Um, new milestone for the Indian Space Program. After their Mars Orbiter mission in 2013, the RLVTD demonstrated that autonomous navigation, reusable thermal protection, and re-entry management have passed this critical test and can be expanded into full-scale vehicles. Excellent. Um, the construction costs only $14 million, uh, and the IR, ISRO hopes to have a working RLV six times as big as this model in the next 10 years. So they're they're going to go for it. Um, it's Mars mission. Only costs $73 million, significantly less than other missions to the Red Planet. So they're getting in at the ground floor, thinking outside the box, doing it for way cheaper than anybody else. It's really a brilliant and wonderful time to be alive and, and in, uh, in the space industry, no matter where you are. So also in the uh, field of space innovation, inflatable spaceships, he says. It's more likely than you think. So likely, in fact, it's being tested on the International Space Station. I believe we mentioned this um, a few shows back, uh, but not formally, that one of the missions up to the, uh, the space station was going to be an inflatable capsule. Um, and then also later on that they were going to blow it up <laughs> just to see what would happen, basically. So we've had to wait quite a while, but finally, one month after launching, NASA is about to inflate the first ever expandable habitat on the International Space Station. It's a pretty momentous event. This sort of technology may one day be used on missions to the moon, Mars, and beyond, because inflatable modules can be launched in a compact form, saving space at launch. All the fun is set to begin at 5.30 a.m. Eastern Time today, when it was today. Today was May 26th, so it already happened. Um, uh, da, 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 so, ah, and they embedded the... You want to say it? Here we go, here we go. They embedded the video, so I will play it. Uh, this is on Ustream, and it was out at uh, NASA TV. So this is NASA public stuff. Let's see. Before they can sign off on its use for future crewed missions. Here is the Frangible Joint Principal Investigator, Clinton Craig, to explain. Frangible joints have been used for quite some time in the United States, uh, in, within NASA, within the, the U.S. military. Um, but it's only recently that they've been suggested to be used with uh, human-rated vehicles. So this is a, uh, a frangible joint that's been functioned. It, it was used on the MLAS, the uh, MAX Launch Abort System project that the NESC accomplished a few years ago, but this is uh, part of that that was, was used. In this particular design, which is an Ensign Bickford Tang and Clevis design, there was a part that attached here at the top. It's easier for him to say. Within this was the stainless steel tube. It's, it's more round now, but in the beginning it was oval and fit neatly in between uh, the, the space here between the clevis and the tang and the clevis. And within the stainless steel tube is a charge holder, which is kind of like a squishy eraser kind of substance, and there's a hole in that charge holder where the mild detonating fuse, the MDF, gets inserted. And so when, when you want this to function, the idea is you detonate both sides of, of the MDF and, and causes the stainless steel tube to expand. Oh. When it expands, um, 
these pre-machined notches on either side of the clevis break and that's all there is. So it's a pretty simple design, but you know, <clears throat> one of the things that we've been asked to do is, is to fully characterize this, this design to find out if there are any sensitivities in the, in the design or uh, if the spacecraft encounters abnormal conditions, is, is it still going to function? Um, those kind of things. A frangible joint. Part of the problem is with, Interesting. with the frangible joints is they are zero fault tolerant. And that means that you know, a single fault in in the explosive charge within a you know what? joint, if, it, if there is a fault, <laughs> I don't think this video is what they intended this video to be. Um, or we were supposed to watch live then. So I think this is actually just straight up live TV for NASA public because the number of watchers is uh, is changing. So. I'm going to pause this, uh, though frangible joints are an amazing thing and certainly going to be very useful in, um, in many aircraft, uh, uh, spacecraft situations. Okay, so we're not going to see that. Um, the Bigelow Expandable Space Module. Let me see if there's another, another link on that. Uh, da, 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 da. Ah, here's a time lapse. Okay. Now we're talking, uh, so I will try to describe it unless somebody already is, and no one is, so there's no sound on this. So um, it's opening several hatches. One, a two, a three, there are four, four hatches. This is time-lapse, so I have no idea how long this is taking, but it's in space, so you want to go, go slow with these things. Okay, and now they are using the... Um, one of the manipulator arms that is uh, one, one of the Canadian manipulator arms, which is on the International Space Station. Uh, they are now looking at... What are they looking at? Whoa, that's dizzying. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh. Wow. <laughs> I've, I don't think I've ever seen that view before. Okay. Basically, they're, as they're panning around, the Earth is moving rather quickly underneath them. So all these, um, all the clouds are moving very, very fast uh, underneath them, and it's time it's time lapse. So that makes perfect sense. Uh, so they're using the manipulator arm, and it looks like they're dragging it out of its, yeah, out of its cubby, allowing it to remove itself from the casing. And now it looks to be completely free. So are they now going to move it to another location? Okay, they're moving it to another location. I know that they're going to attach it to one of the module ports on the on the space station itself. Okay, where are you putting it? Where are you putting it? I know this is so entertaining for everyone that's only listening, but it it's at least it's time lapse. This would have taken hours. <laughs> okay, so are, did they attach it yet? No, they're still still moving it around. That that arm is really huge. I didn't understand how big that arm was. Not even sure where it's reaching. Space station on the dark side of the Earth. Well, that's kind of creepy. Okay, so now they get an interior view of of the the port. Okay, so they're bringing it in slowly, slowly. Lining it up. Oh, those guys are good. Look at that. With that arm and everything. This is why they're paid the big big space bucks. I'd pay them big space bucks, too. It's a great idea. Okay, so... That is the beam hatch. Okay, and... I believe they are almost there. Docking ring is about in place. Okay, so however, installation of the beam is not yet complete. The module itself was launched in a compact form, not be inflated until the end of May, which that's where we are. It'll expand about five times its current volume. The module will expand from 2.1 meters, uh, seven feet wide. Uh, it doesn't look like they're actually... Oh, ISS. Full beam Bigelow expandable 
activity module. Let's see if they have that. Because I'd like to show this. Oh, geez, this is an hour. Uh, mute that. Let's see. Successful them. A little further, further. Oh, okay. Ready for first stage capture, at which point uh, Williams. Will and it's a lot of nothing. Get. Come on. It's Come at on. Any time. Come on. Atmosphere. Come on. A benefit. So as we get one last look at Beam again, you can see attached now to the International Space Station, uh, the module still packed, uh, uh, measuring nope. in at seven feet in length and. Uh, just under eight feet in diameter. Um, we're, of course, going to be looking forward to the expansion okay. coming up in May. Okay, not showing a whole lot. Um, they do have... No. Okay, you're just going to have to find it for yourself because this, uh, this is not being very kind to me. But, amazingly enough, we're going to have inflatable modules stuck on things, which is a lot, lot easier than having uh, big, rigid constructions up there. And... Anything that gets hit by a micrometeorite has issues, inflatable or no. So, one thing with inflatable things is that uh, the interior pressure will keep it rigid. So, that's not really a problem. They've they've got enough air, enough um, enough different mixtures to fill the space station a couple times easily. So, even small ruptures uh, would be able to be patched fairly easily though it is a hard vacuum uh they they know what they're doing um but i know that i i don't know for a fact but what i heard from uh one of the podcasts that i listened to it was the planetary society they were talking greatly about this and one of the things that they're planning on doing with this mission is also determining how things burn in zero g so they were going to be using i believe it was this module uh, with remote camera sensors and other sensor packages inside, they were going to then eject it from the space station, you know, so that it was then at a safe distance, probably with that same manipulator arm that, uh, that attached it in the first place. And then they were going to remotely ignite some um, flammables and see what happens for real in a safe environment. Um, you know, safe being away from the ISS and away from living people and other other things. So essentially it's a uh, disposable spacecraft that they can do that with. And that would be enormously expensive if they did it with traditional engineering. So good on you, mates. Good stuff. Let's see here. And finally, just as every space mission must one day come back to Earth, so too must this segment, but only because we get to cover cool super bus which can literally drive over other cars i'm not sure this is actually something that's going to happen uh it is a prototype of a futuristic bus that straddles um uh watch the video oh the video is out on another another location let's go over there because this is a visual media that we can do here so they have um Computer simulations, of course, this is the kind of thing that would require a completely structured um, everything to, to cope with. Of traffic jams and exhaust fumes, Here we go. Well, the design concept for an electric straddling bus will allow drivers to drive underneath them and help reduce air pollution. Also known as land air buses, this new invention is less costly than subway systems. Traffic hmm. Explore Bus, a Beijing-based company that has invented the straddling bus concept. 60 meters long. Design at the ongoing 19th International High Tech Expo in Beijing. And the passenger compartment hmm. of the straddling bus is two traffic lanes wide and sits high above the road surface on a pair of stilts that leave the road clear for ordinary cars to pass underneath. No matter if the bus is moving or stopped, cars under two meters high can easily pass. Really under two meters. The extra wide, extra tall bus can carry up to 1,400 passengers. That's a lot of people. Up to 60 kilometers an hour. That's the biggest advantage is that the bus will save lots of road space. It was the same function as the subway, but it costs only 16% of what the subway costs. Okay. Manufacturing and construction time are also much shorter than that for the subway. According to Song, 
A struggling true. bus, which is powered by electricity, could replace up to 40 conventional buses, potentially saving more than 800 tonnes of fuel annually and preventing 2,480 tonnes of carbon emissions. Sunshine Just that they're being electric. Yeah. already shown interest in the struggling bus. Song said a vehicle is under production in the East China city of Changzhou to test the feasibility of the design. Ooh, okay. Our first test bus is planned to be put on track in North China's Qinghuangdao city at the end of July or in August. The struggling bus, Whoa, really? if successful, may ease traffic congestion and help reduce air pollution in China. That's kind of a necessary thing. That's interesting. Yeah, I've seen I've seen some of these. Um, oh my, there's some very interesting things that showed up there. Okay, we'll get away from that that screen. I've seen this uh, this concept out there for a while, so I'm not terribly surprised. But it sure is interesting that this is something that they would uh, they would even really attempt. I I did not expect to actually have prototypes by the end of the year. That's of course I'm not. I can't remember when I saw this last. Hmm. I think I saw it a couple years ago. I'd have to look back at uh, probably my Facebook page to see when I posted whatever it, it was. Interesting stuff. Very interesting stuff. Now, I think there might be a little time here, because I found another thing. And it's um, just something I threw in. New evidence suggests a fifth fundamental force of nature. What? This This kind of caught me off guard. Uh, we all know about the four fundamental forces of nature, gravity, electromagnetism, and the weak and strong forces between atoms. But could there be a fifth force still waiting to be discovered? A new experiment performed in Hungary suggests this may very well be the case. Nature News reports that a team of physicists led by Attila Akraznaroke yeah, <clears throat> uh, of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences published a rather provocative paper late last year in Physical Review Letters, preprint version available here, uh, claiming that the that a strange radioactive decay anomaly is indicative of an unknown fundamental force. Despite the incredible claim, their paper wallowed in obscurity until physicist Jonathan Feng and his colleagues at the University of California decided to give it a closer look, and they found nothing wrong with the Hungarian's experiment or conclusions. The physics world is now abuzz with the possibility of an undiscovered fundamental force. Speculation about this elusive fifth force has existed for years, partly driven by the inability of the standard model of particle physics to explain dark matter, a hypothetical form of matter that comprises a huge portion of the mass and energy in the observable universe. So... I don't know what it's going to be. Let's see. Uh, during their experiment, the researchers fired protons at a thin strip of lithium. It, As it absorbed the protons, it morphed into an unstable version of beryllium, which decayed even further, spewing out pairs of electrons and positrons. When the protons smashed against the lithium at the precise angle of 140 degrees, more electrons and positrons poured out than expected. That's odd. Uh, here's the name again. Uh, Krasna, Krasna Horke. Yeah, I think I got it that time. And his colleagues hypothesized that this extra stuff is coming from a new particle that's 34 times heavier than the electron, a possible indication that there's an undiscovered force just waiting to be found. As the Nature News article points out, uh, not to be confused with natural news, which is a hokum site. Don't ever bo go there and don't listen to the things they say. Uh, as the Nature News article points out, there's a decent mix of skepticism and excitement about the experimental results. Physicists are now thinking about different ways to scrutinize this intriguing finding. Researchers at the Thomas Jefferson National Accelerator Facility and other groups in the United States and Europe are now working on the problem and expect to confirm to confirm or invalidate the Hungarian experimental results in about a year. So, <clears throat> what does this mean for you? I have no idea. But it is interesting to know that everything that we know about physics can still be expanded. And that's just good. We like that. We like that kind of thing. So let me see here. I think, uh, I think I've got that and that. Oh, I guess that stopped, didn't it? 
Well, that's okay, because I think we are at a close for this part of the show. Yes, there we go, there we go. Okay, so that's it for this show. We'll be back next Friday at 9.30 p.m. Eastern. The second half will drop Wednesday morning. In the meantime, the conversations continue on the web. Head over to O'ReillyRadio.com, that's O-R-L-Y-R-A-D-I-O, for all the links right at the top of the page, so you can watch us, uh, so you can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, Tumblr, Google+, and subscribe to the YouTube and Twitch channels. Of course, you can watch us live and join in all the fun in the chat, all from our webpage. If you have stayed with us all the way through the credits, how about you give us a hand? Okay. If you have a few dollars to spare, you can contribute to the Patreon and get early access to the show release, and we'll even get special perks. Just follow the Patreon link on the webpage or go over to patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash O'Reilly Radio. I've changed it. This is the first time that I'm saying this, so yeah, it was about due. So, but present Patreons have no problems, no no changes there. So there we go. Now, uh, <clears throat> yes. You can also make a one-time donation directly via the donate button. And if you can't fit us into your rainy day funds, you know, that's fine. We understand. How about you do us a solid and share the show and leave us a review. We're always looking for new ideas for the show. So how about you share what's on your mind and shoot us a note over a really... New exit script. It's just kind of stuck on my tongue. It's new exit script stuff. Okay take 45 okay shoot us a note at o'reilly radio podcast at gmail.com or if you are the more talkative sort how about you uh send us a voicemail over at 470-222-6759 or text that's fine too it's always always ready to take your call or text we can't thank you enough for spending some time with us until next time this has been o'reilly radio part of the Cowan services network music for the show is created by kevin mcleod of incomptech.com the second half is coming up for those of you that are in the live stream so stay tuned and i'll be right back <laughs>